I suppose there is a prior decree before the start of election that cannot be used in the... My Lord, the prior decree will only say whether I have paid my debt or not. Now, in that case, as my Lord, Mr. Justice Yaya Freedy identified, there will be a disqualification attracted under Article 63 of the Constitution. No declaration under Article 62 of sagaciousness or righteousness. My Lord, which your Lordships with your vast experience in civil law, which civil court, when passing a decree, even in a banking suit, and says this money is outstanding, then goes on further to declare that this person has ceased to be sagacious, right? So that's the question. Mr. Mr. Can you just go back, uh, Mr. Mahdum? My Lord. Uh, we cannot attribute redundancy to the Constitution, My even Lord. though it's quite clear that there's no such declaration that can come from any court. But we have to give meaning to the, because we can't just throw it out. So making an effort to giving it a meaning, uh, this paragraph is crucial in Samyullah, that the declaration they're talking about is arising out of civil jurisdiction, inter-party litigation. So, for example, there's a case where a sale deed has been struck down as being fraudulent or forged. Now, there it has been, as a consequence, we understand that that person has committed fraud because he came up with a fraudulent sale deed. That is a bit of a construction that we have to do just to, you know, to justify this declaration given in the court. Having said that, all the other declarations which are coming in through original jurisdiction in the rich jurisdiction not arising from civil jurisdiction are out of the canvas, right? So let's first specify that the declaration we're talking about is inter-parties arising out of civil litigation. Right. Now, in the absence of 232, we would have had to construct what is to be done. I'm just saying that legislation could, not justifying 232, but legislation could say that for the purpose of election, such a civil, uh, uh, such a decree which is arising out of civil litigation could have a time frame for purposes of election. So the question is, can legislation put a time frame on this declaration? Uh, could that be possible? Not the way, the way it's worded in 232. My, my uh, uh, question to you is that, first of all, we, Samuela Baloch helps us identify that which declaratory decrees we talk about, which, which declarations are relevant. Declarations are writing, arising out of civil jurisdiction, which are inter-parties, number one. Now, could legislation, not the way it is done today, but could legislation say that this declaration will continue forever for between the parties, but for the purposes of election, we'll have a time frame. Hello? Such a legislation is not the one the way it is done now in 232, but could such a legislation be possible to say that a declaration inter parties arising out of civil litigation for the purposes of election would only be for five years, even though between the parties it will remain forever till it is set aside, but for the purpose of election. Could such legislation take place? My Lord, uh, that was a bit later, but may I address it right now? My Lord, when your lordship looks at 62.1f, the constitution makers under the 18th amendment do not say that this is a declaration of a civil court. They say no declaration to the contrary by a court of law. A criminal court is as much a court of law as a civil court. Now, if your lordship reads a court of law as a court of law, a court of pre plenary jurisdiction, that would include courts both on the civil and criminal side which decide cases after recording of evidence. And in that, if your lordship does that, then 63 and 62 will have to be read together. There's no way one can read them differently. My Lord, may I just preface sure. this a little further? Sure. My Lord, a question has been asked and repeatedly, that, and my Lord, Mr. Sajaya Afridi asked that again yesterday. Why have two lists, uh, Justice Hilali asked the same question again, why have two lists, what's the difference? My Lord, the two lists made perfect sense under the original 1973 constitution. The list of qualifications was that you should be a citizen of Pakistan. For MNAs, you should be 25 years of age. 
For senators, you should be 30 years of age, and that is where the qualifications ended. All three were qualifications. The disqualifications were that he is of unsound mind, that he is an undischarged insolvent, or he ceases to be a citizen of Pakistan or acquires the citizenship of a foreign country. When your lordship looks at them, there is no disconnect. The qualifications are separate, the disqualifications are separate, sorry, there is a disconnect, they deal with two different subjects. One where a qualification is acquired, one where a qualification is lost in a way or a disqualification occurs because the person loses sanity or the person loses citizenship or a person <coughs> becomes an undischarged insolvent. The moment the court de declares that person as insolvent, then the disqualification is removed. The moment there's a declaration that the person is of sane mind, the disqualification is again removed. The moment the person acquires the citizenship of Pakistan or sheds his foreign citizenship, the disqualification is again removed. The disqualification... Article 62 applies pre-election, post-election, or at any time. My Lord, the way I look at it, election 63 applies at any time. Yes. 62 applies only at the time of election because he shall not be qualified to be elected or chosen as a member of Majlis Ashura. At Party. the time of filing nomination. Yes, my Lord. And a person files his nomination and his opposer submits some document before the returning officer that some, something, yeah, his decree has been passed against him. So he is not eligible to contest the election. My Lord, yes. Is it your meaning? My Lord, my submission. By declaration of law, because opposer can file the application. His uh, nomination form should not be accepted because he is not eligible to contest the election. My Lord, yes. So mm -hmm. What is the main uh, interpretation of Article 62, whether it applies at every time it applies before the election or any time after election? My Lord, 60, when your Lordship looks at 62 and 63 and reads them together, because that's where I was coming to, after 1985... What is the difference between the opening language? My Lord, the opening... A person shall not be quali qualified to be elected, and if you look to 63, a person shall be disqualified from being elected. Elect so there Lord, must be some distinction between the yes, yes. framers of the Constitution. My Lord, may I... If I may interject, my Mr. Mahdoum Ali Khan, and it may help you to respond to my Lord as well, Somehow, as I see it, we've got bogged down in restricting ourselves to reading just a particular provision of the Constitution. And we seem to have forgotten the Constitution as a whole. What is the Constitution all about? What does it do? What are the fundamental rights, Article 17, more importantly, and we are going to a particular provision of the Constitution and just reading those and disregarding everything else. We are disregarding the history of Pakistan. We are disregarding the constitutional history of Pakistan in particular. We are disregarding the fact why these in, uh, uh, amendments were brought into the Constitution. We are disregarding the fact that original Constitution has a greater sanctity than amendments brought there too, unless there are such amendments which enable to serve the people better, for instance, Article 19A, Article 10A. Now, nobody can say that these insertions have taken away something from the people of Pakistan. Rather, they have given something to the people of Pakistan, including Article 25A, compulsory education up to the age of 16. And these are, our, uh, on the contrary, a, an insertion into the Constitution, and there have not been one insertion. They start with uh, General Ayub Khan, and successively more and more encroachment into who I will determine will be fit to govern Pakistan. First of all, the initial question will arise, who am I to determine this? Why can't the people of Pakistan themselves determine? Oh, so what? 
disregard how it came into the Constitution. Now you're stuck with the language of the Constitution. At least I am not persuaded to adopt that approach. I cannot forget the history of Pakistan. And unless you can say they are very beneficial things, we had given public notice in prominent newspapers. Not a single political party, not a single political party in come, has come before us which, will, which has said, leave alone those who are not even in parliament say that this is a good uh, interpretation of the constitution. So we, then we come into, there is another aspect which I consider, there are things which are specifically mentioned. If, for instance, for theft, you mention a particular sentence, and if you say for a trafficking of offense or for some other offense, there may be a punishment. But for instance, the legislature forgets to mention for what duration. You can't possibly say, oh, I'll impose the punishment for murder here. There must be some logic, there must be some reasoning. The reasoning is, you destroy Pakistan, that's fine. You can contest elections for five years. But if you make a single mistake in the nomination paper, you're disqualified for life. Now, we are just stuck with the wording of it. Have we lost all logic and sensibilities? I mean, why are we not, nobody's addressing that. I keep telling, requesting uh, uh, that to be addressed, but we're just bogged down by the 62-1F and the whole of Pakistan because uh, a general decided to impose that has now got us thinking. Leave aside the constitution of Pakistan, we're just stuck with his language. So can we just, what I really wanted from you as a constitutional expert was to expand the vi our vision and not restrict it. But and everybody's just working on those particular wordings, how does this mean, what does this mean, what does a court of law mean, uh, is it a court of plenary jurisdiction, is it a constitutional court? Yes, those are necessary important questions. But in context, in the order of priority, I would put it at number 10 probably, if there are nine other more important ones. Sorry, I went on a bit too long, but can you focus on that, yes, those aspects? Let me, uh, my lord, that was, uh, in a way, your lordship's observations connect and resonate with the question posed by, lord, by my lord, Mr. Said Mansoor Ali Shah. My lord, how did the qualifications and disqualification as envisaged by the original constitution makers made perfect sense. That if you could disconnect them at a time, they made perfect sense because they dealt with two different subjects. In 1985, under presidential order of 14 of 1985, which we call the revival of constitution order, there, all these changes came about with a minor change again through the 18th amendment at that time with a whole host of disqualifications and qualifications were added. And when these were added at that time, virtually we lost the plot. And it would be difficult to say that 62 and 63 are now disconnected provisions. They are connected, they have to be read as a whole. Now, in so far as those amendments were concerned, they virtually were envisaging, as observed by one of your lordships in an earlier seven member bench judgment, virtually a society of angels and parliamentarians who were probably even holier than angels to come into parliament. So there was a disconnect with real life, I mean, which reminds one of your lordship's observations, remind one of the quotes of Abraham Lincoln, that it, is, it has been my experience that folks who have no vices have very few virtues. So virtually, introducing a society of people with no vices and few virtues. But my lord, in these qualifications and disqualifications, these very long list, there is a connection. And the connection is that you cannot read Article 62 without looking at Article 63. 
And even earlier, you could not read Article 62 and 63 without being conscious of the rights of citizens under Article 17 of the Constitution. This court has always been mindful not to disenfranchise people, that the right of people to form and join political parties is there, and a person has a right to contest elections. 62 and 63 both make inroads to an extent under that fundamental right. 